Hare Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Guru Maharaj and Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Guru Maharaj and Srila Prabhupada. How are you, Matajis? I'm okay. How are you doing? Good. I I believe um, Linda Mataji is also on the call today. Yes, Linda. Yes. Hare Krishna, how are you feeling? Hi, yeah, well, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, haven't, I haven't stopped long enough to check. <laughs> well, that means you're busy then. So that's the whole thing. In this, in this craziness, I guess that's good. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So, we get started with today's reading. Okay. Yeah, for some reason, like um, this uh, website is not working, so we are just going to try a different website. Um, and we'll be reading um, the translations uh, for the um, chapter 10. For chapter 10 today. Yeah. Right. Dhruva Maharaja's fight with the Yakshas. Right. Yes. So, whoever has a book, you know, can we can all read? It's just the three of us. Maybe we can read like 10, um, 10 translations at a time. I don't know how big the chapter is. Um, let's see. I can tell you right now. It's not. It's only thirty um, texts. Thirty texts. Okay. So let's do 10, uh, 10 translations each. Okay. We are three of us. So uh, go with the okay, lead. Are we still? Yeah. I'm sorry, are we still on four? We oh, are four. on Canto 4, Chapter 10, and today we will be reading only the translations. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gananjana Shalatkaya Jakshuru Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Svayam rupa kadamayam tadati spa padanti kam vancha kalpatruvyas cha kripa sindhuvya eva cha patitanam pavanevyo vaishnavevyo namo namaha jai shri krishna chaitanya prabhu nichananda shri advaita gadadara shri vasadi gora bhakta vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Narayanam Namaskritya, Naram Chaiva Narottamam, Devim Sarasvatin Vyasam, Tato Janyam Udirayat, Mashta Preyeshu Abadreshu, Nicham Bhagavata Sevaya, Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtaki. Okay, so I guess I can start. Um, we have a new chapter now. Chapter 10. Uh, Dhruva Maharaja's fight with the Yakshas. And I'll read the first 10 texts. Okay, what... what I'm sorry, what text are we? Chapter 10? Chapter 10, text 1. I'm going to read the first 10, just the translations, Mataji. Text 1. Wow. Okay. Okay, one second. Chapter 10, text 1. Okay, got it. The great sage Maitreya said, My dear Vidura, 
Thereafter, Dhruva Maharaj married the daughter of Prajapati Shishumar, whose name was Brahmi. <coughs> two sons named Kalpa and Vatsara were born of her. Two, the greatly powerful Dhruva Maharaj had another wife named Ila, who was the daughter of the demigod Vayu. By her, he begot a son named Utkala and a very beautiful daughter. Three, Dhruva Maharaja's younger brother Uttama, who was still unmarried, once went on a hunting excursion and was killed by a powerful yaksha in the Himalaya, Himalaya mountains. Along with him, his mother, Saruchi, also followed the path of her son. She died. Wow. Okay, uh, four. When Dhruva Maharaj heard of the killing of his brother Uttama by the Yakshas in the Himalaya mountains, being overwhelmed with lamentation and anger, he got on his chariot and went out for victory over the city of the Yakshas. Alakpuri. Um, five. Dhruva Maharaj went to the northern direction of the Him Himalayan range. In a valley, he saw a city full of ghostly persons who were followers of Lord Shiva. Six. Maitreya continued, my dear Vidura, as soon as Dhruva Maharaj reached Alakap Alakapuri, oh, Alakapuri, I'm not sure, he immediately blew his conch shell and the sound reverberated throughout the entire sky and in every direction. The wives of the Yakshas became very much frightened. From their eyes, it was apparent that they were full of anxiety. Seven, O oh, hero Vidura, the greatly powerful heroes of the Yakshas, unable to tolerate the resounding vibration of the conch shell of Dhruv Maharaj, came forth from their city with weapons and attacked Dhruva. Eight, the Dhruva Maharaj, who was a great charioteer and certainly a great bowman also, immediately began to kill them by simultaneously discharging arrows three at a time. Nine, when the heroes of the Yakshas saw that all their heads were being thus threatened by Dhruva Maharaj, they could very easily understand their awkward position. And they concluded that they would certainly be defeated. But as heroes, they lauded the action of Dhruva. 10, just like serpents who cannot tolerate being trampled upon by anyone's feet, the Yakshas being intolerant of the wonderful prowess of Dhruva Maharaj threw twice as many arrows, six from each of their soldiers. And thus they very, uh, very valiantly exhibited their prowess. Thank you, Govardhan Leela Mataji. Uh, I, I see, I see Ruchi Mataji has also joined. Ruchi Mataji, would you be interested in reading also today? You would like to hear? Okay. Yeah, I have to read Yeah, please take care of yourself, Mataji. So, Linda Mataji, would you be willing to read the next uh, 10 texts? Sure. Give me just one second. It would be 11 through 20. Okay, well, I don't know. It says 11 and 12. 
So we must be combined here. I turn the page and it's above 13, so I assume that it must be 11 and 12. The Yaksha soldiers were 130,000 strong, all greatly angry and all desiring to defeat the wonderful activities of Dhruva Maharaj. With full strength, they showered upon Maharaj Dhruva along with his chariot and charioteer. Various types of featured arrows, tarragonas, iron, blood, blood rolls. Bludgeons. Oh, bludgeons, my Bludgeons. Iron bludgeons. Okay. All right. I will go on to text, text 13. We're not finished. Mataji, we're not finished. Oh. Okay. Um, swords and tridents and lances and pikes and spears and all sorts of weapons. Text 13. Dhruva Maharaj was completely covered by an incessant shower of weapons, just as a mountain is covered by incessant rainfall. Text 14. All the suras from the higher planetary system were observing the fight from the sky. And when they saw that Dhruva Maharaj had been covered by the incessant arrows of the enemy, they roared tumorously. Tumultuously, there you go. And the grandson of Manu Dhruva is now lost. They cried that Dhruva Maharaj was just like the sun and that now he had set within the ocean of the Yaksas. Text 15. The Yaksas, being temporarily victorious, exclaimed that they had conquered Dhruva Maharaj. But in the meantime, Dhruva's chariot suddenly appeared, just as the sun suddenly appeared from within foggy mist. Text 16. Dhruva Maharaj's bow and arrows twanged and hissed, causing lamentation of hearts of his enemies. He began to shoot incessant arrows, shattering all the different weapons just as the blasting wind scattered and the assembled clouds in the sky. Text 17. The sharp arrows released from the bow of Dhruva Maharaj pierced the shields and the bodies of the enemies, like the thunderbolts released by the king of heaven, which dismantled the bodies of the mountains. Text 18 and 19. The great sage Maitreya continued, My dear Vidra, the head of those who were cut to pieces by the arrows of Dhruva Maharaj was decorated very beautifully with earrings and turbans. The legs of their bodies were as beautiful as golden palm trees. Their arms were decorated with golden bracelets and amulets. And on their heads, there were very valuable helmets backed with gold. All these ornaments lying on the battlefield were very attractive and could bewilder the mind of a hero. And last of all, but not least, text 20, the remaining Yoksas who somehow or other were not killed, had their limbs cut to pieces by the arrows of the great warrior, Juva Maharaj. Thus, they began to flee, just as the elephants flee from defeated, when defeated by lions. Thank you very much. In the Mataji. So I see um, 
uh, Shri Devi Mataji has also joined. Thank you very much for joining, Shri Devi Mataji. Uh, would you like to read text 21 through 25? And I can read the last six, five verses after you. Okay. Um, we are just reading the English. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Today we are just going to read the translations to okay. get an overview of the storyline. Okay. Dhruva Maharaj, the best of human beings observed that in that great battlefield, not one of the opposing soldiers was left standing with proper weapons. He then desired to see the city of Alkapuri, but he thought to himself, no one knows the plans of the mystic Yakshas. In the meantime, while Dhruva Maharaj, doubtful of his mystic enemies, was talking with his charioteer, they heard a tremendous sound as if the whole ocean were there. And they found that from the sky, a great dust storm was coming over them from all directions. Within a moment, the whole sky was overcast with dense clouds and severe thundering was heard. There was glittering electric lightning and severe rainfall. My dear faultless Vidur, in that rainfall, there was blood, mucus, pus, stool, urine, and marrow falling heavily before Dhruva Maharaj. And there were trunks of bodies falling from the sky. Yikes. Can you imagine? Next, a great mountain was visible in the sky. And from all directions, hailstones fell, along with lances, clubs, swords, iron bludgeons, and great pieces of stone. Thank you, Shri Devi Mataji. Five Thank more to go, and we'll be done with the chapter. But what an interesting fight. In text 26, Dhruva Maharaj also saw many big serpents with angry eyes, vomiting forth fire and coming to devour him along with the groups of mad elephants, lions, and tigers. Then, as if there, was, there were the time of resolution of the whole world, the fierce sea with foaming waves and great roaring sounds came forth before him. 28. The demon Yakshas are by nature very genius, and by their demoniac power of illusion, they can create many strange phenomena to frighten one who is less intelligent. 29. When the great sages heard that Dromara was overpowered by the illusory mystic tricks of the demons, they immediately assembled to offer him auspicious encouragement. 30. All the great sages said, Dhruva Maharaj, O son of King Uttanapad, may the Supreme Personality of Godhead, known as Sarang, Sarangadhanva, who relieves the distress of his distresses of his devotees, Kill all your threatening enemies. The holy name of the Lord is as powerful as the Lord himself. Therefore, simply by chanting and hearing the holy name of the Lord, many men can be fully protected from fear's death without difficulty. Thus a devotee is saved. So this is the end. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports. Maybe we should say thus end the Bhaktivedanta translations of the fourth canto, tenth chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled Dromarajit's Fight with the Yakshas. My Guru Maharaj often says, like, you know, that little boys love these uh, fights <laughs> but, you know, that are described in Srimad Bhagavatam. They love hearing these stories. Big girls like me too. <laughs> hmm. Any comments from the devotees based on what we have read today? Uh, Mataji, I was going to suggest that since we're behind in the reading, we were supposed to read text one through, what was it, one through 10 uh, today. I suggest we continue reading. Let's start, you know, begin text one through 10. Sure. Because we have, we have 35 minutes and I think we can get a lot uh, accomplished. They're, they're not, the purports 
in the beginning are not very long. Sure. Amataji, would you like to read? I can start. Mm -hmm. Okay, Maitreya Uvacha Prajapater Duhitaram Shishum Ma Gastya Vai Druvaha Upayeme Raminama Tatsutal Kalpavatsarao <clears throat> Translations and Purports by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Janak. The great sage Maitreya said, my dear Vidura, thereafter Dhruva Maharaj married the daughter of Prajapati Shishumar, whose name was Brahmi, and two sons named Kalpa and Vatsara were born of her. Purport, it appears that Dhruva Maharaj married after being installed on the throne of his father and after the departure of his father to the forest for self-realization. It is very important to note in this connection that since Maharaj Uttanapad was greatly affectionate towards his son, and since it is the duty of a father to get his sons and daughters married as quickly as possible, why did he not get his son married before he left home? The answer is that Maharaj Uttanapad was a Rajarshi. Saint, how do we pronounce that? Rajarshi? Rajarshi, I, I'm not sure. Anyway. Raj, it's a combination of two words, Raj and Rishi. So it okay. is Raj Rishi. Rajarshi. Mm -hmm. Saint King. Although he was busy, thank you, Sri Devi. Although he was busy in his political affairs and duties of government management, he was very anxious for self realization. Therefore, as soon as his son Dhruva Maharaj was quite worthy, to take charge of the government, he took this opportunity to leave home, just like his son, who without fear left home for self-realization, even at the age of five years. These are rare instances from which we can see that the importance of spiritual realization is above all other important work. Maharaj Uttanapad knew very well that to get his son Dhruva Maharaj married was not so important that it should take preference to his going away to the forest for self-realization. I guess I'll read another. There's no purport here. Ilayam api baryayam vayo putri putriyam mahabatbala putram utkala namam namanam Yoshid Ratnam Ajijanat. Translation. The greatly powerful Dhruva Maharaj had another wife named Ila. Ila who was sorry, the can I you a, what, what text are you reading from? Text Over two, Mataji. Number two. two. How did I get all the way up? I got ahead of myself. Sorry. I'm sorry, continue. Who was the daughter of the demigod Vayu. By her, he begot a son named Utkala and a very beautiful daughter. Text three. Uttamas tu akrito vadvaho mrigayayam baliyasha atapunya jane nadrao Tanatasya Gatim Gata. Translation. Madhuga Maharaja's younger brother, Uttama, who was still unmarried, once went on a hunting excursion and was killed by a powerful yaksha in the, Himal in the Himalaya mountains. Along with him, his mother, Suruchi, also followed the path of her son. She died. Wow. And text four. Dhruvo Bratir Vadam Shrutva Kopa Marsha Shucharpita Jetram Syandanam Ashtaya Gata Punya Janalayam. Translation 
When Dhruva Maharaj heard of the killing of his brother Uttama by the Yakshas in the Himalaya mountains, being overwhelmed with lamentation and anger, he got on his chariot and went out for victory over the city of the Yakshas, Alakapuri. Dhruva Maharaj is becoming angry, overwhelmed with grief, and envious of the enemies, was not incompatible with his position as a great devotee. It is a misunderstanding that a devotee should not be angry, envious, or overwhelmed by lamentation. Dhruva Maharaj was the king, and when his brother was unceremoniously killed, it was his duty to take revenge against the yakshas from the Himalayas. And five, Gatvodichim Disham Raja Rudranu Chara Sevitam Radarsha Himavad Dronyam Purimbuyaka Sankulam. Dhruva Maharaj went to the northern direction of the Himalayan range. In a valley, he saw a city full of ghostly persons who were followers of Lord Shiva. Purport. In this verse, it is stated that the Yakshas are more or less devotees of Lord Shiva. By this indication, the Yakshas may be taken to be the Himalayan tribes like the Tibetans. Very interesting. Okay. Um, so Devi Mataji, excuse me. You want? Uh, should we finish reading like till ten? If Sri Devi Mataji okay. also wants to read from five through that ten, that would be fine. Sure. Um, do you want me to six through ten, Mataji? Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm not able to see the tr uh, Sanskrit translations. Okay, now I can. Thank you. Dadma shankam brihad bahu kam dishas chanuna dayan yenod vigna drisha kshatar upadevyotrasan brisham. Maitreya continued, My dear Vidur, as soon as Dhruva Maharaj reached Arkapuri, he immediately blew his conch shell, and the sound reverberated throughout the entire sky and in every direction. The wives of the Yakshas became very much frightened. From their eyes, it was apparent that they were full of anxiety. Take seven. Tato nishkramya balina upadeva mahabhataha asahantas tanninadam abhipetur Uddayudhaha. O hero Vidur, the greatly powerful heroes of the Yakshas, unable to tolerate the resounding vibration of the conch shell of Dhruva Maharaj, came forth from their city with weapons and attacked Dhruva. Satan apatatobira ugradhanva maharataha ekaikam yugapat sarvan Ahan Bhanai Stribhi Stribhi. Dhruva Maharaj, who was a great charioteer and certainly a great bowman also, immediately began to kill them by simultaneously discharging arrows three at a time. Text 9. Tevai Lalata 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 Ishubhi Sarva Evahi Matma nirastam atmanam asham san karmatasyetat. When the heroes of the Yakshas saw that all the heads were being thus threatened by Dhruva Maharaj, they could very easily understand their awkward position and they concluded that they would certainly be defeated. But as heroes, they lauded the action of Dhruva. Purple. This spirit of fighting in a sporting attitude is very significant in this verse. The Yakshas were severely attacked. Dhruva Maharaj was their enemy, but still, upon witnessing the wonderful heroic acts of Maharaj Dhruva, they were very pleased with him. This forward appreciation of an enemy's prowess is a characteristic of real Kshatriya spirit. Jai. Tepi chamum 
अमृष्यंत पादस्पर्शम इव रग शरेविध्यन युगपद द्विगुणम प्रचिकीर्षव just like serpents who cannot tolerate being trampled upon by anyone's feet the yakshas being intolerant of the wonderful prowess of dhruva maharaj threw twice as many arrows six from each of their soldiers and thus they very valiantly exhibited their prowess thank you very much uh, shri devi mata ji and govardhan lila mata ji for his reading um so um you can um you can share from the text that you have read if you like okay so we're we're noting in the first few texts that Dhruva Maharaj got married uh once he was placed on the throne his father uh placed him on the throne and he married um the daughter of prajapati shishumar and she and her two sons kalpa and batsu so after his father he uh, it, there was this prabhupad makes mention that we should note that normally um the father would have quickly tried to get his son married even if he had daughters too sons or daughters he tried to get them married as quickly as possible and and that's his duty as a father but uh he didn't do that in in the case of his son and um maharaj utanapad uh wanted to become self realized and so as soon as his son uh was of that maturity because remember he's very small and very young when he became um capable of taking the throne then uh the father uh left for the forest just the way his son did okay and he wanted self realization and so we have to understand that this is a very rare occurrence okay um Adruva Maharaj also did the same thing he was only 5 years old imagine he left uh for self realization at the age of 5 i mean this is amazing and um so we do know how great of a soul druva maharaj was you know and how much he was favored by the lord and protected by the lord and uh his here his father uh similarly wanted self realization and so that took precedence over anything else that uh he needed to accomplish okay um it wasn't as important for his son to get married as it would be for him to go to the forest for self realization and so i think we're learning here uh, also that for ourselves the most important thing we can do is to become self realized that's number and of course we have to be on that platform to do, to go and um it doesn't mean we have to go to the forest don't forget this is a different yuga and the yuga dharma of this age is to chant the holy names of the lord in the hari krishna maha mantra it's um i think maybe in that age it was meditation uh, it seems that way um if this was the yeah i think the satya yuga and um so this would was to take precedence and so when we become more and more um krishna conscious as we go along and our consciousness uh becomes more and more elevated what will take precedence is to become self realized above anything else that we're doing any other activities okay so i let's say that the mundane activities so that's what i got from uh the first uh text and of course uh then we understand that dhruva maharaj had another wife and she was the daughter of the demigod vayu and he got he had a son named utkala and a beautiful daughter so with two different two wives 
and children from each wife. But now his, his uh, younger brother, Utama, uh, was not yet married. Now, I, you know, I don't know what age Drew Maharaj is here when he took the throne. You know, I, I would imagine even in those days, uh, I've, you know, we hear, we hear of kings taking the throne at a very, very young age. So I'm, I'm gathering that he was kind of young. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's calculated in here, but in any event, his younger brother was not yet married and he went uh, on a hunting excursion and he got killed by a yaksha in the Himalayas. And his, um, his mother was following him on this hunting excursion and she too died uh, I'm assuming was also killed by the by these yakshas. Now, it, in the beginning, it's understood that the yakshas are um, they're followers of Lord Shiva. That's what it says in the fifth translation. Um, go, the people who follow Lord Shiva uh, are those ghostly type persons. Remember that Lord Shiva always never looked. Um, Real, he always looked kind of disheveled, you know, he had the hair all matted and long and all this and probably he had a lot of dust all over him and this and that. Very, very powerful devotee, very uh, exalted. Um, so it's kind of strange to me that these yakshas, um, I, I, if they are followers well, I'm not sure if the yakshas are the same as these followers of Lord Shiva. There might be two different people. From what I'm seeing here, um, he, uh, the, the brother, Uttama, was killed by the yakshas in the Himalayas. And he got so overwhelmed, Dhruva Maharaj, he, became, he started lamenting, he became angry. And we have to understand... Um, Prabhupada is telling us it is not uncommon for um, a kshatriya to, uh, to have anger, to become overwhelmed with grief, and to become envious of the enemy. In, his, in the position as, as a, a kshatriya, I think this is probably expected. It's his duty. And so it's Dhruva Maharaja's duty to take revenge um, as the king, right? Because his brother was just killed just like that for no reason whatsoever. So it was his duty to take revenge. Now I'm understanding, yeah, I think these are different. The, the yakshas are actually demons uh, from, what I'm, from what I'm understanding. And um, Dhruva Maharaj went to the Northern direction of the Himalayan range and he saw a city full of ghostly persons who were followers of Lord Shiva. I don't know if these two are connected, but it seems that, um, yeah, it says it's stated that the Yakshas are more or less devotees of Lord Shiva. Okay. Um, and they may be taken to be the Himalayan tribes like the Tibetans, which uh, that's very historically I bet, very interesting. So I, I need a little clarification here because the yakshas are uh, are devotees of Lord Shiva, and yet as we go further on, we learn that they are demonic demo demons. So I don't know which one it is, and uh, I just needed a little clarification. Maybe Sri Devi knows as we go on, um, but that's what's going on so far. Thank you. Yeah. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, Shiva's followers are hobgoblins, pishachas, yakshas, rakshashas. You know, all these are also great uh, devote. Ravan was a great devotee of Lord Shiva because he's so easily pleased, and he grants benedictions also very easily. They worship him in order to gain benedictions and become more powerful. So some of these, uh, you know, demons are actually worshippers of Lord Shiva. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I knew that there were all kinds of 
different people who worshiped Lord Shiva, but I didn't know the demons worshiped him. I know. Yes, yes. yes. demons, uh, Srila Prabhupada has described demons, hobgoblins, witches, ghosts, yakshas, rakshashas, you know, all these lesser beings, you know, they say, you know, lower living entities, you know, operating at a lower level, that means most of fashion ignorance and like that, they are attracted to worship Shiva because he's easily pleased, he grants benedictions, and, uh, you know, he, he he's just a very uh, compassionate and generous-hearted uh, demigod. So he just gives uh, benedictions very easily. You remember that story of Bahamasur? Anyway, that's a long story. We were not going to go there. But the caveat is, that's why we have to be so very careful because Lord Shiva allows the entities to take birth in the wombs of those who do not practice religious principles, you know, who mm. wrong times of the day or in or inauspicious times, he, he then sends all his followers to take birth in such, in such wombs. So that's why it is so important for us to be careful about all, even the act of procreation. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sri Devi. That Thank takes you. care of it. Mm -hmm. So we just have about 10, 12 minutes more. And I would appreciate the purports coming up because uh, I, you know, I'm not able to recall exactly all the things though I have some vague idea, but it would be nice to go back to screen share and see from verses seven to 10, is that possible? I don't know if anyone is there. I just, uh, I don't, uh, I'm not able to recall much. I can only recall a little bit of uh, the purport that we were just looking at. And that tells about the importance of self-realization that though, you know, you may have other engagements, try to keep self-realization as the topmost goal because it is. And how important it is, is clearly illustrated by, you know, Maharaj Uttanapad saying, I'm taking off now. <laughs> you may, you know, some children may be married, not married, but that's not so important. I have to go. So that's how Maharaj Uttanapan left. But I, that's my only recollection of that purport. I don't remember. Well, that's okay. Let's what? see. We had, um, in text six, there was no purport. It was um, as soon as Dhruv Maharaj reached Alakpuri, uh, he blew his conch shell. The sound reverberated throughout the entire sky and in every direction, and the wives of the yakshas became frightened. And mm. in their eyes, it was apparent they were full of anxiety. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. And then mm -hmm. text seven, it says, Oh, hero Vidura, the greatly powerful heroes of the yakshas, unable to tolerate the resounding vibration of the conch shell of Dhruva Maharaj, came forth from the city with weapons and attacked Dhruva. And then another one, there's no ah. problem. Dhruva Maharaj, who was the I great got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. I remember the purport now because you let, you know, you made me recall it by reading out these verses. It's about the Kshatriya spirit that when they saw how bravely and how expertly and how nicely Dhruva Maharaj was fighting back using his prowess, his skills in archery and his knowledge of weapons, uh, even though they were on the opposing side, that means they are the enemies, because he was doing, wielding the bow and arrow so dexterously, so expertly with such command that even though they were the enemies, they applauded, they appreciated, they admired and they acknowledged Dhruva Maharaj's skill in being a very valorous soldier, a very valorous uh, fighter on the battlefield. And then Srila Prabhupada goes on to say, this is the true 
characteristic of a kshatriya that even though someone is his enemy he can still appreciate the spirit of bravery or determination or skill in um, wielding weapons and this is the hallmark because every uh, what to say every varna as we say is characterized by certain qualities and the qualities of kshatriya is heroism bravery determination generosity of spirit all these things are described as the quality of kshatriyas they are fighters they are soldiers they are very brave they are described as very brave and so when they see heroism in battle they see skill in archery in um, dhruva maharaj they see how um, bravely he is fighting they acknowledge that and even though they are enemies they they applaud uh, dhruva maharaj for his expertise now i can remember that and prabhupad says this is the true quality of a kshatriya so we can understand a person's qualities by their behavior what does a brahmana do he likes to read he likes to study he likes to explain basically teachers you know they are in the level of brahmana because they have the acumen they have the intelligence they have the memory they have the interest first and foremost to read scripture explain scripture brahmanas have the six activities what are they um patan patan yatan yajan yajan dana pratigraha what does that mean they learn scripture they teach scripture they uh, conduct worship they teach how to perform worship they give in charity they receive in charity so these are the qualities by which brahmanas work so teachers professors academicians researchers um counselors architects these are all people who are considered brahmanical because they use the intelligence to uh, either create or to to explain or to teach or uh, basically people who use their intelligence um they are not inclined to going out and managing things and you know uh, organizing a whole mass of people or doing you know that's not really a brahmanas he is an advisor to the king the king will take advice from his brahmanical ministers that's how we understand the quality of each person now who is the kshatriya kshatriya are the ruling aristocratic class they are the royals as we say they are um in charge you can say they are meant to rule and what does that rule mean they are supposed to protect the weak they are supposed to take care of the weak they are supposed to govern nicely they have to maintain law and order so this is the function of kshatriya and they are described as as i said just now brave valorous you know determined heroic generous and like that so these are the qualities of kshatriyas then what is the third one vaishya vaishya means he is a merchant mercantile that means they are very good in business you can see some people around as how sharp they are when it comes to money matters they know what is going on in the business world they know how to trade they know how to make money both ways that means when the market is going up market is going down they just know how to deal with all that stuff they are just very expert at money making so therefore shila prabhu described that these people are mercantile class of people they are the grain merchants uh, traders business people small business big business um, they are bankers they are supposed to be in agriculture and crop protection this is actually their role as vaishyas and the shudras being physically strong but not capable of intelligence or managing themselves are supposed to humbly serve the other three classes and depend on them for protection for sustenance for maintenance and so on so shila prabhupada is describing the quality here of the kshatriyas how valorous and brave they are and how they are generous in acknowledging another's good qualities or skills or expertise in olden days kings were so generous and so munificent and of course they had tremendous wealth because they were the kings and they were collecting taxes from people and of course that was a different era altogether so if musicians or artisans or a painter or dancers or poets anybody came to the court and please them by their artistic expression 
The king would immediately toss a beautiful diamond necklace and take it off from his neck and just throw it here. <laughs> take this necklace, take this ring, take this bangle, take, you know, they were very generous and they would support the artists and artisans and sculptors, uh, musicians, architects, art, um, artistic people, you know, of all kinds. They were supported this way by the royals because artists are creative people. They, they can only express art forms. They are not capable of making a whole bunch of money. You know, that's why they say painters are generally starving and live in a garret. <laughs> because these are the professions that traditionally uh, don't make much money. But they have a gift. They have this artistic skill. Who will support them? Who will take care of them? So you see, the Vedic system was so nice that in the olden days, if people were given to being a poet, who cares for a poet today? He has to go out and work in some crummy job trying to eke a living when his heart is longing to sit down and write poetry. Or somebody is a painter, somebody is a dancer, somebody is um, a sculptor, let's say. The creative form of expression is... Who's going to pay them? Who's going to maintain them? Who's going to give them a job? Because it's all about money, right, today? But it wasn't like that. In those days, every class was taken care of. The humble cobbler, the hair, uh, what do you call it? Barber. Everybody had a place in society and everybody got compensation for their contribution to society in such a way that they could live comfortably. It wasn't like one class, you know, the ones who can make the most money and exploit the most and have the sharpest brains in the stock market, they just corner a large share of the world's resources and gobble up everything and the rest of the world goes hungry, which is what is happening today. It's a demoniac civilization. So you see, we are living in very dark times, but in the olden times, everything was well organized. It was systematic. There was a place for everyone. There was dignity of labor. There was justice for all. Even the humble cobbler could knock on the door of the king's palace and ask for justice. That was his right. Today, who, ca who cares for the small fry? Who cares for the little guy? No one cares. In fact, you can buy justice and you can get away with even murder if you have lots of money. You remember that O.J. Simpson case? Oh, yeah. Where he brutally shot, not shot, he stabbed his wife and her boyfriend to death and he paid a hot shot lawyers there was a whole team of lawyers who tore the opposition to shreds and presented evidence upon evidence upon evidence trying to establish that unless you know there's 100 percent proof and anyway and so they he, he got away what i'm trying to say is he could buy his way out without getting caught though everyone knew he had done it so this is the situation today there are so many that, that get away with it now. Right. You know, right. So many. And, uh, you know, and they, they kill over and over and over, and it, you know, and they get away with this. Mm-hmm. 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 Very, very bad. It's very, very bad. I, I can't even, I don't even have, um, it's unconscionable, in, uh, unconscionable behavior for me. I can't even fathom it. So upset. Right, right. And uh, there is that beautiful story where, you know, Yudhishthir Maharaj has presented all those conundrums, remember? And this is the one where this explanation is, you know, I saw this vision, uh, an elephant went through the wall, but this huge elephant went right through the wall, but his little tail got stuck. Can you remember that? And yes. Yudhishthir Maharaj says that, you know, all the big fish will get away but the little guy will get caught and he will not be able to get justice because the, you know, the others will buy their way out and get away as you, as you have pointed out with murder. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, there was such a system of well organized so that society could live in harmony and peace and everyone could progress to the real goal of human life, which is self-realization, which is not there now, which is a very demoniac civilization where anything goes feel good, you can do it. You want to feel happy, gratify your senses, eat and drink yourself silly and, you know, do whatever you want. There are no rules. Nothing matters. There are, there's no shame in doing anything wrong. There is no repercussions for doing anything wrong. People live together, have children, 
there is no shame attached to you know living like that nobody thinks we are living in sin it's considered normal so what to do this is the age we live in but we can see how important it is to understand read and discuss vedic literature like we are doing now because we know there is a better life there is a better way and this is the way society at least we come to know something because otherwise without this knowledge what would we know without shri laprabhupad giving us all these um, you know wonderful literature scriptural literature and you know real knowledge where would we be we would know nothing and we would just go along with the rest of the world you know and go on to take another birth but here we have such a wonderful chance to purify ourselves and help others in the process of purification and then remember what is the real goal of human life which is just to purify ourselves and go back home exactly exactly i get very upset that so i don't even want to start talking about it because i get i get so upset with this this particular yoga very mm. upset. mm-hmm Mm-hmm. Very dark times we are living in. I I used to partake of all kinds of crazy things until I came 